So welcome everybody. My name is Martin Wirsing. I'm uh, here the moderator of this session. I'm from the University of Munich uh, in Germany and will shortly uh, introduce the session. Uh, just tell you how we plan it. Uh, we will first uh, make some, just present the uh, speakers of the session. You will see that we're here in a very dynamic and adaptive environment. So um, uh, you see uh, different, well, many faces, uh, several faces. And um, after that, uh, every uh, speaker will give a talk of about 10 minutes presenting the position paper. And then we will have, um, say, 15, 20 minutes, depending on the time, uh, discussion uh, among the panelists, and then open the floor for about the same amount of time uh, for your questions. So we are here uh, in a session about institutional MOOCs policies. You heard a lot about MOOCs. Everybody uh, is here, in fact, for MOOCs. But when you look at somehow the institutions, uh, then more and more institutions are becoming interested in MOOCs, but it's not so easy to integrate them into the typical university teaching environment and curricula. Uh, MOOCs have a different kind of audience. There are some students, but most of those um, students of MOOCs are not from the own university who provides the MOOCs. In fact, MOOCs are made for international audience quite often. Um, MOOCs have uh, many opportunities for universities. Um, that is this wide, wide reach and reputation if you're well, you will become world known through MOOCs. But there are also a number of challenges uh, from the beginning. People were saying, well, what are the completion rates? It's so, it, it's terrible. And then um, what happens if you have a MOOC which has not the right quality? If you have a shit storm um, in, in the media or uh, somehow among, among uh, well, uh, the, the uh, students and then it comes to the media, then this is not good for the university either. There are all kinds of issues with e-assessment, data privacy and so on. Um, so um, the universities these days have to position themselves uh, and develop uh, a position with respect to the uh, uh, with respect to MOOCs. Um, my own university uh, is also in this case. We are doing uh, MOOCs since four years, quite successful. But we're always in the discussion about the institutional uh, policy uh, of the of the MOOC. So um, issues are the governments. How do we select MOOCs? Quality assurance. Um, how, in fact, to integrate them? with normal co courses, with box, blended learning. Uh, then the issue of credit points, uh, the issue of revenue, MOOCs producing MOOCs is expensive for universities. How do we get the money back if we have an international audience which does not pay? So these are all uh, kinds of questions we want to discuss um, in this um, session. And I would like now to, uh, well, ask uh, in fact, the uh, speakers of the session to present themselves. I just say um, uh, a few uh, words uh, here. I'm going in the order uh, from from you seeing from uh, right to left, if it's correct. <laughs> and always difficulties in in this. Um. So near nearby uh, are uh, Mauro. Uh, uh, next to me uh, is Mauro uh, Kalise and. Uh, uh, his um, co-author, uh, yeah, Valentina Rida, uh, then uh, Ulrike Wild. Uh, she is alone here, but the next author uh, again is Xenia Kidimova. She is co-author with Evgenia uh, Kulik. Uh, they are both together. Evgenia is here as well, uh, but they decided that Xenia will present and half done, it's half done. Um, so he will uh, present, uh, well, he has also a co-author, eh? yeah, also a co-author, but you just a short round of presentation uh, uh, of yourself. Uh, Mauro, maybe you start. Uh, 
I'm yeah, now you start for presentation of yourself, and then for the for the for the oh. presentations of the whole thing, just uh, say a few okay. words about um, uh, your person. Yeah. Thank you. Well, actually, I am a political scientist, so that's my main field, and uh, I don't really know how to get venture into this book business ten years ago, and I'm now the director of Federica Web Learning, which is the largest Italian <laughs> platform. We have like 80 MOOCs running, and uh, it's been quite a challenging experience, and we are now by all means a well-established national educational multimedia facility. And we'll say more about how it all came about. Well, I'm Valentina Reda. I am also from Federica Web Learning, uh, the center of the University of Naples Federico II. I am a research fellow now. Uh, it's my second year in full time uh, on the MOOC issue, but uh, I have a background also in political science. Uh, but uh, well, um, it's um, it's uh, a good challenge and uh, on on the front of the political science uh, and uh, now well we, I started a new a new adventure. My name is Ulrike Wild. I'm at Wageningen University. I'm a program director for online and open learning. That means I do a strategy and translate strategy into first projects around open and online learning degree and open. Um, hello, my name is Ksenia Kidzimova, and here is also my colleague uh, Evgenia Kulik. We are from um, High School of Economics, National Research University from Moscow, Russia, and uh, uh, we are representing here e-learning office. Uh, Evgenia is actually the director of e-learning office. We coordinate all activities of our universities concerning MOOCs. Uh, we have 80 MOOCs, 50 of them on Coursera now, and we also started to uh, integrate MOOCs in our university curriculum for our on-campus students. So we would like to share our experience with you. My name is Halfton Hexbakin, and I am a uh, sociologist who work at the uh, Department of Sociolo Sociology and Political Science. And I am from the, new, the, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, uh, and I am the project manager for the MOOC initiative at NTNU. So we are in the starting grid of uh, understanding MOOCs and producing them. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Um, I think we should start now with the contents and uh, Ulrike starts. According, we, we stay with the program. Everybody gives a kind of 10 minutes uh, position statement. Ulrike uh, is the first and uh, you see already the first slide. Please, Ulrike. Yes, <coughs> I will tell you what we did, how to integrate our MOOCs uh, on campus so that students can get credits for MOOCs as well. And we came across some myths and we had to debunk them. So our, my subtitle may tell you already a little bit what, what's going on. Um, just few words about Wageningen University. Uh, it's a university with a city, not a city with a university, but we are actually quite known in the field of life science and agriculture. Uh, we have around 10,000 students and a, a lot of international students as well. And uh, we engage as well in micromasters and open uh, degree uh, online masters and online uh, open and online courses on edX. So we are quite active on the field of uh, professional learning and open and online learning as well. And why do we so? We have um, a strategy or a vision what we would like to become during the next years, and we called it, since we are an uh, ag agriculture university, anyhow, an eco education ecosystem. Um, and this consists naturally of a campus, a strong campus, which is the richest learning environment, but already surrounded, it's in the degree, it's not only normal campus courses, but as well online courses. I told you we have two, three online masters, so we have a lot of online courses as well. Around that is our professional and open courses. So MOOCs on edX meant for a broad <coughs> public, since we uh, uh, like to do that for dissemination of knowledge and as well professional courses for um, and looking for different target groups there. 
And um, on the outside, of course, we have some open educational uh, resources as well. Why is this actually an ecosystem? You could say, yeah, that's nice. You have uh, four different ways of things you do. But we think as well there, is a, there are two actually um, powers which make it a system. First of all, we decided that all the online materials from course to materials only should be <coughs> able to be used in different settings. So if we make a MOOC, we deliberately say it should be used on campus or parts of it at least should be used in campus as well. Secondly, we like transitions. So we don't like that it's just, you know, you have the normal campus students, then you have online students. We would like to make it possible for campus students to take online courses to be flexible more, and as well for people who probably start more outside to come to the co uh, uh, campus once and to actually have a sort of stackable credit system. And we do so because we think it's very nice to have as much as flexibility and differentiation in the future as possible. So that's why we sat down and thought we have, oh, I told you that, that's normal for me, I forget always that. We have, um, we have a treasure. We invest a lot of money in in uh, producing MOOCs. End of the year, we will have 20. That costs a lot. We put our best um, uh, teachers actually in front. Uh, and our own students cannot follow these MOOCs if they say, because it's not in their program, oh, maybe I would like to follow this MOOC as well. <laughs> actually, we thought that's not right. And uh, as well, with the, uh, viewing already the future, we even would like, and. I think there are more sessions coming up which will tell you about this, even in-source MOOCs from other universities because we are a specialized university and it would be great for our students to have MOOCs and online courses from other universities which we will probably never have. So in the view of differentiation, we thought, okay, let's try and get, as a first start, simply make it possible for students to follow our MOOCs and get credits for it. Okay, so we, yeah, we did it by incorporating them in our study guide as electives. What you see here is the treasure and the myths around it. And let's talk a little bit about some. And let's talk, you already said that, about the academic level of volume or qu quality of a MOOC, which sometimes where people say, oh my God, it's a MOOC uh, that can't be good. Well, a course is neither good or bad because it's a course. Now is a MOOC neither good or bad because it's a MOOC. It depends totally what you put in it. We have our best teachers in that and we already, we always decide our MOOC should have academic standard. That's one of our points of view. They can be introductory, they can be more uh, a medium, or they can be advanced. That's something the lecturer himself can uh, judge and can describe. And of course, if you put them, if you let students follow that in the elective part, always the examining board will decide if it's right to put it into your program on your level. So what's the point, we thought. And we have already Capita Selector and other points. So actually, so new, using something in self-study, we thought that shouldn't be that new. So one myth gone. Contact hours or regulations. We wonder then, what about contact hours? Because I forgot to mention, we are not talking about integrating MOOCs in blended courses, we do that as well, but really taking the MOOC as it is, as it runs on edX for a course on uh, in, in, in the, for the students. Actually, there was nothing about uh, something that all our courses had to have contact hours. It was only for the first year BSc. So then it needs to be contact hours in it. All the others were free. And as well, other regulations, if we describe in our study guide, our courses, we found learning goals, we found uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, our students had to spend like that. So we could describe the MOOCs quite nicely according to that. So no regulation. 
credit and size. Now it becomes already more interesting because we all have semesters or periods and something. We, for instance, have six and we fit our courses normally nicely into a system of three of six credits. And suddenly people start to ask, yes, but who says that a MOOC is three credits? It could be two, it could be one, it could be three. That doesn't fit in our system. And even it runs on edX. We don't run it in exactly the same periods. But yeah, um, and then students, it, 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 there was a belief behind it that it should <coughs> always end up nicely to 120 credits because we are research master. But I think our students are grown ups. If they like to take an extra course, it's up to them to decide how many credits they will collect. I mean, there are grown ups in other, if they do something wrong, they will, uh, you know, we treat them as well as grown ups, so to speak. So we thought, no. Um, actually, this shouldn't count either. Examination, now it gets more interesting because actually what we have on edX is no watertight exam. No, not at all. But, I mean, if you offer it for students, there's one big advantage, they are on campus and it's quite easy to organize an exam twice a year. So we decided, okay, oh. Oh. Did I do anything? Ah. <laughs> oh, it's uh, the MOOC yeah. ghosts, probably. Uh, I can yeah, tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they want. They do not want that you have the no, students no, exactly. on on campus. I you should tell. give examinations <laughs> yeah. everywhere. So we decided to have examinations uh, simply, and the students can enroll for the examination. What the happened? Computer turned off. Huh? Huh? The computer turned off. The computer turned off. Uh huh. This is the. Ah, okay. <laughs> so what? <laughs> now it's it's rebooting now. So. You know the next thing is what I'm talking about is systems and administration and this is hitting me back now because there is where it really gets difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. I mm -hmm. mean, you already. I see a few people nodding. All our systems, you know, our student information systems, everything enrollment is based on what I just told you. Periods, credits, amount, things. And it's virtually impossible to fit in a course who is not running in a certain period and where you don't have to enroll exactly in the same system because we decided to let the students enroll on edX and, said, and then you enroll on campus for the exam. So, and this was the trick, I'm so sorry it's lost, because that's the challenge actually, actually who stays. Oh, but who knows, my thing mm -hmm. will be back. Mm -hmm. But of course, everything, the last, then it comes down to what are students doing? Do they like that or not? I think it's lost, is it? No, no. Ah, yeah, here yeah? it is. Yeah, okay. it is. Ah, we yeah, will have a short run. recap. Opens. Yeah, it's running. Yeah. Uh, technique. Yeah. Every, everybody knows that we lose from 45 minutes yes. of lectures each time five minutes for technicalities these That's days. That happens in Germany. Yeah. Italy we lose 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can discuss that later. <laughs> yeah. Ah, it's traumatized. Okay. Okay. It's other <laughs> <traumatized. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> ghosts. Yeah, sorry, I have to. One gone. One gone. One gone. So examination was no problem, but administration, actually, that's the hard part, because it really, it it means that it's not that we have to do something extra around the administration and it's very hard to fit it in. There's the big problem. The other is the student expectations. How do they like, most of our MOOCs are self-paced courses, to have them in their program. They are not used to that. We did a study with uh, one MOOC before, which was actually a Spock, not in the sense that it, we added something, but we, we only had Wageningen students into that. 
And for instance, in the first year, 66 students first said, yes, I would like to take the course. 29 started to take the course. 21 uh, said they would do, uh, showed up for the exam. And 18 passed the exam in the first trial. So it's a better rate than the normal uh, MOOC <laughs> thing. But you see, and then we asked them, of course, what would you like about that? And they liked the flexibility a lot because they said, I'm not forced to that. But they disliked that they had no regular, uh, not a system or deadlines in it. So it's a little bit schizophrenia in the students as well because they like it that they can do it whenever they want and they dislike it at the same time. So we decided probably that's something they have to get used to it. The other th big thing is it's very funny. We got so many questions about how to enroll on edX. I mean, these are students who are on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and then you ask them, please enroll in edX, and suddenly, because they're so trained in our system, as soon as they are on campus, they think campus, and they think all these kind of things. For them, it's nearly a culture shock that we ask them something different. So, we have, this year, I don't know any numbers, because we don't count them in the beginning. I will know in the end how many students uh, we'll try an exam. What I can tell as a lesson is, uh, now what we did is let students register for the courses next time and not only for the exam because then we can follow them more, uh, better. Don't assume students know their way on MOOCs on <laughs> platforms, so give them a clear description. Start a campaign promoting it for students and for teachers actually, where you emphasize what doesn't deviate from our current system because actually in the end it's not such a big step beside the administration. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Next speaker is Halfdan. <coughs> Can you get your... Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, I'm actually very pleased to be on this panel discussion because it's the, my first time in a, uh, in a format where we can actually sit down and discuss instead of uh, having a talk for 15 or 20 minutes and receive feedback. And I think this uh, session here is uh, rather important because I wish that we can put uh, light on the conditions or the organizational challenges of uh, working with MOOCs at universities. And the question is, are universities uh, flexible organizations or are they uh, conservative? <coughs> and uh, and that uh, sort of reflects uh, the title of uh, my presentation, which is called Organizational Areas for Improvement When Realizing MOOCs at Universities. And I also have to stress that uh, our p policy paper uh, is uh, co-authored uh, with Inga Longset, who is uh, present there, raise your hand. Ah. And, uh, but we are not that well developed uh, when it comes to actually working with MOOC in Norway. And uh, just to give you a sort of walk through what is uh, the main idea behind the title, because uh, the reality is that uh, even though that uh, I am, uh, we work at a technology university, uh, our faculties are not very interested in education. Uh, and uh, because they want to research. Um, so uh, in 2012, uh, we got appointed a new rector who said that, okay, we are gonna improve our university uh, across a range of fields. And one of these uh, fields was education. And for that, uh, the top management at NTNU, uh, which is the largest university in Norway, we have about 40,000 students, and there we develop a lot of technology, the technology from scratch, among other things, to pump up the oil from, uh, you know, uh, from the North Sea and so on. But, uh, but uh, they initiated a, a, a t um, initi they initiated an initiative called uh, Antinu Teaching Excellence, which tells the story about the conditions that we have had to work with MOOCs. 
And uh, what the uh, rector, uh, or what the Gunnar Bodin, <coughs> Uh, did was to actually make an open call saying that, okay, now you professors are going to uh, think creatively about how can we rethink education and, uh, and how can we use various technologies, not only the digital, but other, all kinds of technologies. And uh, about 30 uh, educational projects got funding, uh, large and small ones. And, uh, but only a few of them actually explore, explored the, uh, the concept of digital technologies. And only one, one project of all these 30 projects, pro pro educational projects was interested in MOOCs. And that is a huge contradiction coming from a technology university, which has about 100 years tradition of, uh, of uh, um, educating uh, engineers and so on. So, uh, so, the f so if there was like an interest for MOOC at our university, it was foremost grassroots driven that we have uh, in enthusiastic uh, professors who have a, a passion for the, the digital. So, and so we have to say that, so I really have to emphasize that um, if there was like an interest for MOOCs, uh, they are bottom up directed, I would say. So it didn't exist any institutional policy whatsoever on MOOCs. Uh, but based on that, um, uh, a colleague and my former supervisor, Arne Kukan, uh, we wrote a couple of proposals. And uh, he authored a book called Smart Learning, or which is a sort of trendy, trendy thing. thing. Um, uh, if you sort of uh, adapt to that silicon uh, vernacular. And uh, that explored the ways that social media and ICT influenced learning and education. So he made an approach to the uh, Department of Teacher Education. Both of us work at the uh, Department of Soci Sociology and Political Science. It says something about where the initiatives actually come from. And that resulted in uh, two uh, in, um, in experimental uh, development with MOOC. And so uh, the way that we have worked with MOOC at NTNU is across two uh, different directions. It's one is like what we call it internal use, where we basically just experiment. Uh, we invite professors and we say that, okay, now we're going to develop a, a MOOC from scratch. And uh, we uh, do that. Uh, we make the, uh, the content and so on. And uh, thereafter, we test it on ourselves. And from that, we publish. Uh, the other one, uh, which we call external use, was a a uh, very traditional MOOC, which is fitted into uh, how we run uh, our uh, uh, further education or continuing education. So the MOOC that we developed was aimed at uh, teachers because they have been criticized in our K-12 education system for not being digitally literal enough. So it was, uh, it, it targeted that uh, group um, and um, so everybody could sort of enroll. You could either participate and get like a certificate, uh, or you could actually to take an exam. Uh, but I really have to emphasize that this was an educational development project, and about 2,000 people have completed it, and it was hosted on a local open edX uh, platform that we run. So we are not partners with the Coursera, we are not partners with uh, Open edX, but we are partners with FutureLearn. We recently signed a contract with them. So we are sort of in the starting grid, as I uh, early emphasized. But, uh, but we have worked with MOOCs for the last uh, f four or five years. And that has, uh, has um, uh, meant that we have been uh, met the uh, organizational apparatus of the university. Uh, which uh, can be fun, but sometimes a lot, but also there's a lot of obstacles to overcome. And um, so we sort of, I will only assume that a lot of these areas for organizational improvement that we have called are actually very familiar, but I think that these can be sort of contributions to the sort of overall discussion on how we run and uh, produce MOOCs. So the first, uh, the, our first uh, <laughs> suggestion is of course that we need to have like a MOOC strategy on the agenda. And why are we saying that? Well, uh, we think that we uh, need, uh, the, the, the idea was that when we try to look around in our own organization and ask, do you have like any proper tools where we can run our uh, online courses? They didn't exist. Uh, we had poorly developed LMS and it wasn't actually sort of fitted for the MOOC concept whatsoever. 
so uh, we think that we need a holistic institutional MOOC strategy, and perhaps we should outline an, an institutional MOOC roadmap, which sort of automatically leads to resources where we can develop courses and research properly. Uh, the other uh, uh, area for organizational improvement is aligning the organization to MOOC production. And basically, this deals with project management. Because uh, we can have uh, uh, our specific ideas how uh, how um, uh, a project management should, or how a project should evolve. I'm talking about all these things happening behind stage. But it, it's not necessarily that funding agencies or uh, internally in, the, uh, uh, it, in our organizations that they agree with them. Uh, and that creates a lot of obstacles. Uh, so we have to uh, so we have to simplify and fa facilitate the production process of MOOCs. Uh, and then uh, the question arises: uh, Should we have a separate MOOC infrastructure? And that is sort of related to the first point uh, I, uh, I uh, raised in, um, in in our policy paper. And that is now we have uh, what we call a national and an international. Uh, uh, infrastructure. So we have not all Norwegians are good in English and they prefer to speak in Norwegian. So we have separate courses uh, which is our sign for uh, for the Norwegian speaking audience and then we have an international platform which means that we have now become uh, a partner with uh, FutureLearn. Uh, and then we have uh, the fourth uh, matter which is legal issues which is very complicated uh, because we have been uh, faced with a lot of complicated questions which deals with privacy, do we need a data protection agreement, uh, and so on. And the first thing that we do is to pick up uh, our uh, phone and we call our legal advisors and we ask them, uh, uh, what is your position on this? And they say, well, um, I'll get back to you. I, have to need, I, do need, I need to do some consulting. And then we make another phone call and still work in progress. Uh, and then uh, when we want them to come up with a rec recommendation, there is great uncertainty. So we get vague answers many, many places. So I really think that we should have like an explicit focus if we can discuss that later. Uh, so, and, and why I'm saying that? Because in technology, there is always an embedded design and and thinking, and uh, I believe that it always sort of precedes the current legal understanding. And, uh, and so what can be done? Well, we have constructed something that we call Entenu Drive, which is a uh, acronym for a program for the digitalization of education. So based on all these educational projects that first was initiated uh, four or five, uh, three, four years ago, the top management said, uh, now we're going to work with digitalization. But the top management uh, only conceived this is as an idea, and it sort of gave this assignment to us. And we have to sort of uh, uh, make, up the, the, uh, um, make up the initiative and construct an organizational apparatus which puts these ideas of digitalization into practice. And that's where the uh, MOOC, Antinuk uh, MOOC initiative, which is a project which I am project manager for, and I am hiring people um, who should be, uh, uh, is a hub for development of digital competence. So we supervise other professors uh, we, who wish to make mo MOOCs. I get a lot of phone calls. And the first question is, what is a MOOC? And we have to explain that. And we research. But every time, uh, I get a phone call, uh, there is a new challenge uh, and a new problem, and I do not have the solution. So we need to have an initiative which deals with all these development issues. And for that, we have created NTNU Beta, which uh, tests out all these new learning technologies and so on. And then uh, we wish to uh, take uh, these two projects and have a full scale, um, this is a rather ambitious project, uh, have a full scale um, um, competence enhancement of our professors. And for that, we have created into new uh, ICD, which, for example, could mean that at the d department, some professors would create a MOOC, and through that collaborative process, you would sort of engage all 
many of the professors to uh, get interested in the digital. Uh, so this is a way to sort of think uh, on policy in terms of bringing the MOOC concept in a larger perspective, in that holistic perspective that we are uh, talking about. So this Enter New Drive is in the making. It's a program. Uh, we will increase, uh, we are about 16 or 17 people and we have diff different competencies, every, uh, ranging from technical support to video uh, producers to uh, researchers and so on. But we wish to make this permanent. And, uh, but the only, and, uh, and the only one way, I believe, uh, is uh, that you need to have a institutional initiative which allocate and specify resources and give mm -hmm. us the freedom to shape it. And if the, uh, in order to sort of enhance uh, the digital competence of our students and of our uh, university educators. So I hope that we can, so I only assume these are familiar. So do you have this institutional initiative or do you are aiming at? Currently? No, we have it. We have it. We are we working it. We, so this we is your university rector yes, support. Yes, that. Okay. So we are supported by them. But okay. it, it shows the, 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 uh, the process of mm -hmm. MOOC starting at the grassroots level and then you create something okay. and mm -hmm. then uh, they, we, they let us develop it mm -hmm. and they see the, uh, the fruits and the results of it and they say, okay, uh, now uh, we have to create an, an organizational apparatus or construct of some sort which s supports uh, various ways, and, and, and a central part of that is MOOC. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Mauro, Valentina. Oh, no, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this one. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm just going to introduce our, well, policy statement that, that is about, well, the state of the art of the institutionalization process of the use of MOOCs within the Federico II University through the Federica Web Learning Center. Uh, with a special focus, uh, with a special attention paid to the problem of certification, uh, that has always been one of the most important challenges uh, of, uh, well, the use of MOOCs within universities from their explosion. Uh, well, as of today, I'm brief in, in this introduction of the context. Uh, as of today, the, uh, well, the credential market is leaded by the uh, big American providers uh, that moved definitively last year from the free formula to the freemium formula with uh, an attention and, uh, well, an investment and resources concentrated uh, on uh, concentrated on the development of special programs that are not, uh, not so different from the traditional programs uh, for non-credit programs, but with, uh, well, a main difference that is uh, that the certification is awarded by the book provider, um, well, in affiliation with universities and not by universities. And in general, they are, uh, well, less, um, less expensive uh, and shorter than traditional non-credit uh, non uh, programs. Uh, so uh, with uh, a new formula that is, well, a win-win model for providers and universities. On the one side, the providers, uh, well, reach uh, two main goals. The first one is outside in the market, that is the branding credentials. I, I called it, well, we called branding credential, but is, well, the big opportunity to uh, reach uh, more and more credibility uh, as accredited uh, as credential institution accreditating institutions um, so uh, and on the other side working inside uh, well their market so on the customer customers retention users retentions uh, so on users loyalty management creating integrated environment to construct and to build the e-portfolios and CV online um, and uh, well other forms of um, loyalization, the fidelization of, uh, of the consumers. Uh, 
the, uh, so on the other side, uh, uh, it's clear that the first uh, important contribution from university is to enhance uh, this, uh, uh, well, the opportunity to, uh, well, gather more credibility by the providers uh, because, well, they contribute to brand uh, the, the providers uh, in, its, in itself. But for universities, it's clear, I, uh, well, I didn't put here because it's clear that the first advantage uh, to go on the big providers is organizational one uh, and related to development of, of the platform. Uh, but then the main important advantages are related with the consolidation of the of the universities in the non-credit in the non-credit market or credentials. Uh, and uh, well, without interfering with the degree market, so the core business of uh, universities in particular, well, the, um, uh, well, in, in the universities in general, uh, and disseminating university brand uh, above all in the case of the less known universities. Uh, so this, well, this is the general model uh, proposed by the, uh, well, the big providers is, okay. Uh, is well uh, uh, based on parallel tracks, uh, as someone said before. Um, well, the uh, separation of the online courses and the on campus targets, online targets and on campus targets, because really they are not in a direct competition. So, well, now I leave the word to Professor Kalize to propose our uh, model, the, the Federica model. Well, I use it. Well, thank you, Valentina. Actually, the reason why we, you know, we are social scientists by training, so we are interested in this business in the first, uh, at first because we try to understand how this world is developing. And it is very important to see how this American model is coming along uh, with two separate and non-converging tracks. This is very important. And it's exactly the opposite of what we try to do at Federica and what we also try could become a successful European model. Because, uh, you know, at Federica actually, uh, Federica Web Learning is, is about 10 years in the making. I mean, we have been producing courses, e-learning courses for the last 10 years and we had about 300 courses before moving, moving three years ago into the MOOC dimension. And basically the difference with federica.unina.it and federica.eu, which is the MOOCs, is that there is no video in the pre-MOOC era. Okay, that's only to say that from the very beginning, our MOOCs are conceived of as a perfect substitute for a curricular course. So in this sense, we had none of the problems that you have been, in a way, facing, because it is very clear. Probably it arises from the fact that I am an academic and I, you know, coming from that kind of background. But I always, always took it for granted that a MOOC would be just a curricular course, possibly made better because of the multimedia you know, possibilities. But at the end of following a MOOC, you would just go and give an exam. And you would give an exam in a very traditional way, as, just as all other students in the University of Naples give exams. Of course, in order to do this, we need to have our own platform. In fact, Federica it's got its own platform. We are very proud of the platform. This is a separate uh, but very interesting item which comes very little on the table when we discuss about MOOCs. I mean, uh, when you talk about MOOCs, there is very little discussion about interface. And there has been very little development in the recent years with respect to interface. You know, the edX, the Coursera, even the FutureLearn interface, which is maybe a little bit more accurate in this respect, don't make much of an attempt to blend video, content, links, sources, interaction, editing together. While we think this is a major aspect of the new opportunities which MOOC can provide the classroom with. So basically, what we do have at Federica now is about 80 MOOCs plus 300 pre-MOOC courses, which are perfectly the equivalent. The student can follow that course and then take the exam. And that's, as you would say, step one. Of course, this does not only concern University of Naples students, because, I mean, anyone can enroll in a Federica MOOC. In fact, we have students from all over the country, and that's because in many cases, what, you know, an introductory course of political science or physics one or whatever, I mean, it's gonna have the same kind of, basically, uh, curricular and syllabus 
that in the University of Florence, University of Bologna, the more so as we are inviting professors from other universities. We have about a dozen of the most illustrious academics from all over the country, which are doing their MOOCs for Federica. And we offer this to anyone, anywhere in Italy, who wants to use a MOOC for her classroom. I mean, a teacher is free to do it. We give her a class code so that they can enroll their students. And the students, you know, can follow the MOOC and then have the flip classroom experience. And then at the end, they can take their exam in Bologna or in Milan or whatever that MOOC constitutes a basic, you know, the same end book. In many cases, you have the same end book, the same textbook, the same material. That do not vary a lot if you stay on the basic curricular courses. Now, of course, this does not mean that we are not considering also the possibility of going international. Uh, a good number of our MOOCs are in English, and we are now, you know, uh, getting into an edX partnership so that we can also, you know, communicate our MOOCs to the, you know, it's an Italian is the fourth most studied the language, not spoken, but most studied the language worldwide. Uh, which makes it for, for quite a, you know, attractive, you know, it's not as strong as Spanish, but of course uh, we are doing our best and, you know, we're now planning a, a, a set of course, which is another aspect we don't have the time to go into, but clusters are very important for us. We are now working at a cluster on art and media, which of course is going to become quite a hit uh, for Italian, you know, kind of cultural uh, and, uh, and artistic tradition. And again, of course, this creates the condition as far as the credit system is concerned, we are first going to experiment crediting through edX. And it's the easy way to do it. I mean, edX is living, you know, it's just giving certificates. And again, a student can get the real credit by simply taking the exam. Mm -hmm. And we have those students as a renewable energy every year. This is very important. If courses reflect your curricular, you know, standard, that means, you have like 1,000 students for you know basic courses, maybe 5,000 if you're talking about calculus in the sole you know yeah. engineering university in Naples. I mean, it's big numbers. Every year, those 5,000 students come again and again. Then you can have all taking calculus all over the world in Italian. But of course, this creates the condition, and this is our very ambitious goal for the fall of 2018, of having MOOC degree. MOOC degrees are going to be the final step of consolidation of this degree strategy because we're going to have a full degree in MOOC and we're working on six, you know, it's going to be uh, economics, it's going to be social sciences, it's going to be computer science, six MOOC degrees that you can take completely from a distance whether you are in the University of Naples or whether you want to enroll through a MOOC system. So this is to say, we, from the very beginning, st got started on this uh, idea that quality came first. And that's why, and quality should be in our own vision, the quality of a top academic course. The moment you leave that standard, you are in a no one land and you, you you, you lose what has been from the very beginning, you know, the, the real asset for the American invasion of MOOCs, which is, you know, the big brands, the big names, the big courses. But Americans have been able to go only that far in terms of, you know, real credit system because they move as two parallel tracks. Mm -hmm. We are trying to have those tracks converge. Let's see how successful we can do, and we're hoping okay. that other countries, you know, may follow suit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just one question here. Um, you, are, you have Federica, you are the founder of Federica, and you are uh, with the University of Naples. How, how does the University of Naples use your courses? What is the relationship? Well, the relationship is we are the University of Naples. Okay. Because we are okay. a center at okay. the, okay. I mean, okay. we are okay. a, a center good. of the University of Naples, so we are, an, you know, we are in all possible respects the University of Naples, okay, and okay. everything which is multimedia goes through Federica, okay. and it's all professors of the University of Naples, or in some cases from other universities. Okay, okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you.
No, last not least, Xenia. <coughs> Okay, dear colleagues, um, I'm pleased to present to you today a very brief um, speech about uh, our experience, how we integrate MOOCs into our university curriculum. Uh, but uh, first of all, let me briefly introduce my university to you. Um, well, uh, it's um, uh, very young but ambitious Russian university founded in 1992 and now we have uh, 31,000 students in four campuses in Russian and uh, we have 10 uh, big academic departments. Um, by now we created 80 MOOCs, 50 of them uh, on Coursera have, uh, I have already said and uh, we have more than a million enrollments uh, in two platforms, it's Coursera and uh, Russian Open National Education Platform. Uh, and on Coursera we are now in top 10 uh, by the number of courses. Um, but we not only develop courses, but also uh, pay attention to management solution and organizational and economic models and also to learning analytics. Um, so in my brief presentation, I will tackle upon um, uh, the goals of creating MOOCs and why we integrate them into our curriculum uh, and uh, tackle briefly upon some uh, results. Uh, well, um, uh, first of all, um, I should say that our university has made a significant, uh, significant progress uh, in its uh, online education development recently, and we, um, well, uh, we appointed um, several purposes uh, why we should develop online projects. Um, it's uh, for variability and providing the quality of teaching, uh, then uh, to promote our social responsibility as a center of high quality education. Uh, after that, to provide uniform standards of teaching in our four campuses, uh, and also to promote our researchers and teachers and educational programs among the global academic community. Um, uh, we started to include MOOCs in um, our curriculum since uh, 2013, so it's almost four years. Uh, and for this purpose, our university developed a regulatory framework in accordance with which uh, our schools can make decisions about credit transfers for MOOCs. Um, and improving the quality of educational programs and uh, at the same time reducing the cost of the implementation, we pay a special attention to guarantee, validate and control the quality. Uh, and if you go to the level of each um, academic program, uh, we see that in our university we have a special management tool uh, to guarantee the quality of each program. And this tool is called Academic Council. Um, and academic councils um, headed by academic supervisors, um, um, uh, they are responsible for all aspects of quality for each educational program. So each academic council consists of experts who form the curriculum of uh, every educational program and um, um, they decide, for example, what lectures to invite, whether that should be our university lectures or some <laughs> lectures from other universities, from abroad, from somewhere. Um, uh, academic Council decides um, what students to accept and so on. And sometimes um, Academic Council comes to a decision that they need to take some MOOC to improve the quality. and. Um, Generally speaking, um, uh, the goal of integrating MOOCs into our curriculum is to improve the quality um, 
and to achieve some specific tasks with limited resources. Uh, so what are the cases when we believe uh, it's reasonable and justified? Uh, first of all, when we take a non-HSE MOOC, um, so uh, then um, it means that this MOOC has some unique content. Um, and. Uh, for example, it can be delivered by a very renowned professor whom we just can't get to our campus. Um, and the second uh, thing is when we take our own HSC MOOC, um, and um, that means that we just would like to, um, to provide variability uh, of our on-campus education because, for example, we have up to 60% 60, 60 electives in our master programs. Um, well, um, if, we, uh, if we talk about how we integrate MOOCs in our curriculum, currently uh, we have two main mechanisms. Um, first of them is um, that, we, uh, um, that we make it at a request of a student. Um, and uh, this, uh, this is based on regulations on academic mobility, which we have. Um, and then uh, we need a student's application and uh, his or her certificate. And after that, academic council with academic supervisor will decide whether to accept this certificate or reject it. Um, this is uh, the first mechanism. The second mechanism, um, uh, it is so-called white list. Uh, white list is created by academic council um, and if a student successfully gets through a MOOC course uh, which is in white list, then um, he's granted to be credited. So uh, then a student, uh, it, it's not his initiative, but it's from white list. Uh, and then uh, we have to be sure that uh, we get uh, proper courses, really high quality courses in the, uh, this white list. In, um, I will tell just a few seconds later about that. Um, well, actually, um, uh, these white lists are new things for us and we started uh, from uh, this academic year um, massively including MOOCs in uh, HSE curriculum and um, this year we have uh, MOOCs included in um, curriculum of 11,000 students of our university and it's over th uh, 350 MOOCs uh, now we have. So. Um, here, of course, we can an analyze what types of courses are replaced by MOOCs and what uh, strategies different departments and schools uh, choose and what students, uh, what difficult students has and uh, have and what their satisfaction rates and uh, things like that. Uh, and um, we have already some uh, results uh, and we analyzed a lot of internal data um, well, for example, I, I just can't uh, t tell you now all the results, but I, I will just uh, point a few of them. For example, um, more than 60% uh, of educational programs decided to expand the list of exi existing elective courses. So they added MOOCs to the lists of electives and uh, enlarging the choice for students, uh, for example. Uh, but also we have many programs that included MOOCs uh, as a compulsory course. So um, if we talk about uh, how different uh, schools and departments use MOOCs. Uh, we should say that, for example, most of uh, humanities um, decided to, to have uh, MOOC in blended format because they told us that they uh, surely need to have uh, an exam on campus, so to say a traditional exam. But if we talk about uh, our uh, computer science programs, uh, they included MOOCs uh, as MOOCs because uh, they wanted their students to use this uh, uh, 
special tools and special computing uh, programming assessments and uh, they decided that um, the results of these MOOCs are quite reliable so we can just uh, give credits for them. Uh, so if um, um, but irrespective of the field of study, we should say that um, educational program faced a, a very important challenge um, because academic uh, supervisors um, told us that um, it was really a challenge to decide which MOOC is really a high quality MOOC and which MOOC of thousands uh, presented now on major platforms should be chosen to be integrated. Um, so uh, actually we understand that now uh, we are facing a problem of these unified standards and we have to, I think, develop some um, unified university system of selecting MOOCs and assessing the quality of external MOOCs. Uh, so at least um, this is going to be our uh, well uh, nearest challenge and um, also there is one more important problem I just and I'm finishing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's the problem of uh, reliability of exams and of assessment because um, here we need um, here we need some special uh, some special tools to be sure that um, uh, this or that exam is really reliable. Um, and uh, here we use psychometrics. We started to develop it about one and a half year ago, and now we actively more and more actively use it. Um, and psychometrics uh, allows us to validate assessment results and control tests and peer assessment quality, and also even to predict uh, whether this or that uh, student uh, will behave, um, w will um, t to to predict fraud behavior on exams. Uh, so, um, well, as uh, there are really a lot of uh, topics inside MOOCs that should be further. Um, further learned and um, there are many really interesting topics for applied research in the field of MOOCs um, and that's why uh, we started to um, to research ourselves and we also to uh, would like to coordinate and to cooperate with uh, our colleagues all over the world actually and we also organize um, a big scientific conference on MOOCs in Moscow together with Coursera in October this mm -hmm. year so we would like to yes <laughs> invite all of you <coughs> to present and to share experience here and after that maybe in half a year in Moscow uh, that would be also nice um, well, and thank you for your attention. Okay. And I think that yeah. we will yes, we'll discuss, discuss because I heard okay. that, uh, that for example, what Ulrika said, that, that is uh, very much like to what we have, because yeah. uh, I, I haven't mentioned that, but we also had the problems yeah. about okay. students, about the yeah. students' yeah. experience. The, uh, it's, okay. it's also very interesting. Okay. And even the yeah. fact yeah. that yeah. they okay. can't so uh, enroll uh -huh. themselves. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. First, let me thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a question directly to you. Um, namely, uh, you explained it a bit, but uh, if you have these external MOOCs, a lot of external MOOCs, I have not seen anybody uh, else in universities using so many MOOCs from other universities, huh? external MOOCs in that sense. So, um, uh, and you're told it's difficult with the examination. Um, how, how do you do the examination? Do you have, uh, if you have a, well, a course from a specialized teacher and a master and you don't have the same, you said it's complementary, you have the same, uh, the not the, the, the same uh, scientific knowledge inside your house, how do you Th the that, that is the, the very big problem for us because uh, if we have a course, um, well, um, a normal course, usually compulsory course, mm -hmm. then we plan 
that we have to somehow check the knowledge. Yeah. So um, mostly that we have on-campus exam, mm -hmm. but when it's really very specific course, mm -hmm. then we have to rely on the actually this MOOC's mm -hmm. result. Mm -hmm. So we, we sometimes it really comes to the problem that academic council says, is okay, we just don't have such a narrow um, expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is really a very big problem, and that's why uh, we think that proctoring is mm -hmm. very important. Yeah, yeah. And if our, s our students could take exams on Coursera, edX, uh, no matter uh, whether they take it, but with proctoring, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then okay. this yeah. will solve this problem. And we, we already started the discussions with Coursera, yeah. and maybe it will come to some uh, some yeah. decision. It's yeah. a modern it's a modern solution. In Bavaria, we have a different classical solution. We make a contract with the university. We get the lecture from, and they do the examination, and they get money by, s by Skype, yeah. Yeah. online In or on or online. Or yeah, yeah. We have on online just online Skype. courses. There's a kind of uh, virtual Bavarian university which it's organizes like a spoke. these online courses. So, so, then so it's, it's like more a spoke. More it's more of a spoke, spoke, than a spoke MOOC. model. Yeah. Yeah. But you really do it as a MOOC. May I ask the others? Um, do you have experience with external <coughs> MOOCs? And if yes, how you do the uh, selection? Uh, <laughs> we are currently talking, but Anjin is here, and she should probably answer that in uh, several consortia, because mm -hmm. then you talk, and Carlos mm -hmm. as well, you trust each other, and you, you form a consortium, and then you exchange exams, and I think mm -hmm. that's the yeah. way you yeah. can do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, because otherwise, I don't know about you in Russia, but for us, the funding, I can't, even if, if there is a proctored exam on edX, Mm -hmm. There will always be costs, and somebody has to pay the costs. I can't yeah, tell yeah. the student, it's forbidden by law in Holland, that he has additional things to pay. Sure. So, yeah. end so of story. So yeah. Same for us, yeah. yeah. Sure. <coughs> we cannot yeah. ask money from our students. Yeah. Plus, isn't there another problem with the proctored exams? Yeah. Uh, for example, I know that you guys just, just got the Big Brother Award uh, yes. for working together with Coursera, um, and I'm... Um, we I'm from from Aachen University in Germany as well. I think we have some big data security uh, uh, issues yeah. if we want to force our students into proctored exams from other mm -hmm. universities. So we're doing basically the same thing, just as Ulrike uh, said, that we exchange uh, 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 the exams uh, with other universities, and we're thinking about doing this. Uh, uh, with e-assessments as well. I think this, for us right now, is the mm -hmm. only way to go because we can only use proctored exams if, if uh, um, anybody, everybody is okay uh, with using those and paying for those. No, but uh, there's this legal issue. I mean, yeah. um, Halfdan was talking about that. Uh, well, Mauro? I mean, the easy way seems to be simply that you borrow the content and you do the exam. I mean, yeah. this is by way, and uh, mm -hmm. anyone can borrow mm -hmm. the content of a Federica course in another university, the more so if you are just, you know, reproducing yeah. exactly the standard course. And then mm -hmm. they just take the exam at Bologna or whatever. So that's the basic way in which within mm -hmm. a public system, yeah. exchange can be very much, you know, fostered. And then when you start getting into this proctoring, of course, as you were saying yeah. before, you have all data security and problems like that, that's very complicated. Mm -hmm. But I would actually question that, uh, I mean, since we are in yeah, a discussion right, forum, yeah, sure. because, I mean, what will be our role in the future if this unbundling goes on? Will we be the assessing? Will we be uh, uh, actually the one who assesses the person or will we be responsible for programs? Are we more mm -hmm. uh, editors of courses and somebody else does it? So there is more to it. The moment you give away your course, and your assessment. I mean, I, I don't have the answer, and I don't know mm -hmm. where it will mm -hmm. develop, but there is more to think about. Yeah, that, well, we are ab about institutional policies, but the yeah. point is that the role of the teacher uh, is changing in the way that it's not anymore a content provider, probably, and we have to see how the institution reacts to that. Yeah, and here may be the role of the university, no, mm -hmm. not th yeah. only the mm -hmm. role of teachers. Yeah. Yeah. So really uh, whether we're going to be an assessment center or an um, education mm -hmm. program provider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's... 
Uh, well, can I only sort of raise the question here? Uh, it's a completely different matter, actually, but because the only thing that I see is that we're lagging behind and you're in front. Uh, and there's such a huge diversity. Uh, and sometimes we started out at the same time, it seems. I don't know if you started it in 2011 or 2012, and then you have developed such a huge amount of courses. What are the conditions at your universities which makes it so uh, that you're so productive? Uh, I would like to hear some more thoughts about that because if you can share some ideas. Well, basically structural funds. I mean, we would, have, we would not have I'm gone anywhere without structural funds. I mean, which is cohesion funds, which are, you know, and so, I mean, our Federica has been funded by e European Union beginning in uh, 2007. And we are just about to get a new uh, grant. So if you're asking me what made it possible in mm -hmm. the first place, mm -hmm. this is. Then we also had, we were lucky enough that we are very cohesive, top-down, sort of like so management. grants from the European Union? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to point that out, you know. Yeah, it's European um, Union funding. And again, because this morning, you know, there was a suggestion, and it is true. European Union, as far as Brussels is concerned, yeah, yeah. does very little. And it's mm -hmm. amazing to me how mm -hmm. little they do, yeah. despite all, you know, all the constraints they have. But as far as structural funds are concerned, mm -hmm. there is quite That's an opportunity yeah. if you do find ways to. I mean, mm -hmm. we simply, you know, managed to have an application. We got the funding, and after this funding has been over, we're getting new funding. And this is, is very important for Eastern Europe, of course, mm -hmm. because that's where most of the next wave sure. of, of e, you know, EU funding is, is, is going. So uh, I'm saying this because that gives you the idea of centralized control. Mm -hmm. And I'm also very much shocked by the how such a complex thing you could put. I mean, that's that's the dirigistic, yeah, yeah. probably. Mm -hmm. You have the, the yeah, director yeah, who yeah, say, yeah. now you have to do. Uh, the rector and the strong management team who really see the perspective and understand the, what, what is the yeah. real strategy and goal and of course can found funding because yes. it's really important. We, we mm -hmm. just couldn't produce these 80 MOOCs if we couldn't get mm -hmm. the funding from rector and from well, yeah. may, may I ask you, all, all of you, I mean, funding is an, a critical <laughs> issue, and the point is that in the first five years, uh, it's easy to find funding, but how about sustainability? Um, is your university or uh, some kind of body giving you sustainability mm -hmm. in producing, continuing to produce MOOCs and working with MOOCs, etc.? Uh, Ulrikis, you start? Yeah. Okay, you're already at the, at the mic. Or well, yeah. To put it very actually, Frank, the conditions that we have are very hard. Uh, mm -hmm. We compete uh, for peanuts, and I wouldn't say it's peanuts. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so we have been treasured mm -hmm. uh, that we have good relations uh, with the top management, and mm -hmm. uh, we only have one funding agency in Norway which funds mm -hmm. uh, uh, anything within uh, anything dealing with ICT, and they have about. 12 Norwegian uh, kroner, that would be like uh, mm -hmm. one and a half million euros, mm -hmm. uh, less than that. And that, mm -hmm. and you have many university colleges and universities competing for that. Mm -hmm. So the acceptance rate is about 10% mm -hmm. in order to get yeah, funding. Yeah. Uh, our main problem is, uh, and a lot of it is, is only on uh, development issues, so you only have one course mm -hmm. that you can develop. Mm -hmm. So it becomes like yeah. one course on each institution that would be correct isn't mm -hmm. that uh, fairly i would mm -hmm. say yeah they're, they're nodding yes and your university um, i mean your university president could somehow sustain uh, well uh. we have very limited re re resources and uh, it is very hard so that is why i'm asking these questions so it mm -hmm. seems like the sure. european union is obviously um, uh, no. in, in your case no. but Good how would ha and and it seems like you have how, how would it look if you only had national funding? Would it, the story be different, or there would not be a story? Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> yeah, I it is. Yeah. I can simply say this. Now, yeah, we simply yeah. do it yeah. from our yeah. funding yeah. we get. So there's always a bunch of mm -hmm. money uh, mm -hmm. a Dutch sure. university yeah. gets and gets mm -hmm. in, and of course we try. What I said. We try on the other way to build business models mm -hmm. with other target group of learners. And let me say one thing, a business model is not only 
euros back. Mm -hmm. it, it's different. It's the name. It's the profile. It's something actually as well, some, a, a very idealistic thing in our case, because we are all in all sustainability and food security, mm -hmm. that you really reach the world in a way. Mm -hmm. But it's as well that eight nearly 10% of our uh, master students nowadays have followed a Wageningen MOOC before they come. And it's using mm -hmm. it on campus. So I have multiple ways which I need to show yeah. up that I can go on. How long? I don't know. But we do it to don't for not having a Kodak moment in mm -hmm. five years or ten years, because exactly what you tell, if we mm -hmm. haven't our internal organization yeah. and haven't the project management and haven't the ideas and haven't experienced how we do it and how we integrate it, if then everything starts shifting, probably you are too late, because that's mm -hmm. not something you do in half a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See if I can yeah. answer yeah. to your question yeah. about sustainability. Yes, I mean, it all got started with the EU money. Then we became an established center within the university. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving on to edX, and so we are planning mm -hmm. to have some kind of you know, revenue sharing. And we are also moving into the larger public corporation mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, market, mm -hmm. yeah. where we have established now as a brand. You know, Federica mm -hmm. is by large yeah. you know, you know, yeah. acknowledged as the best brand in Italy, and so mm. that helps yeah. us drive yeah. that kind of sustainability. We hope so. So that that also would somehow your university rector uh, incite to give you money. I mean that that you have established this brand. Yeah, so yeah, but reputation again, I mean is this. Yeah, 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 but then yeah. you can get it from you know yeah. from the market because mm -hmm. of course the market yeah. is there. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and yeah. Xenia. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I would like to mention about brands, mm -hmm. because when we first entered Coursera with our first courses, we found out that um, up to 30% uh, people, I in enrolled uh, people, uh, ha haven't heard even about our university before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we immediately showed that to our top management mm -hmm. and our rector and said, okay, have a look. Mm -hmm. yep. This huge yep. amount of people never have mm -hmm. ever never heard mm -hmm. about HSE University. So let's invite these people. Let's tell them mm -hmm. about our s researchers, about our programs, and yep. that's why uh, then the program was successful. They understood that uh, really it's it, it's a very nice thi uh, a thing to invite uh, students to somehow mm -hmm. promote brand. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as for sustainability, um, here we should say that though we started to uh, implement MOOCs, mm -hmm. uh, we look at uh, MOOCs uh, not as a disruptive technology, but as a tool just to get better quality, mm -hmm. to, yeah. Yeah. to mm -hmm. somehow enlarge uh, the mm -hmm. electives and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it doesn't mean that uh, MOOCs are completely different from what we are doing mm -hmm. on campus. It's just the new, um, new way mm -hmm. to do it. So from the point of view of institution, I hear, I hear that the reasons for doing MOOCs are three... Uh, well more okay, less. maybe <laughs> m apparently my mic doesn't work anymore. Uh, threefold, then. Eh? Yeah. No, 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 not. Okay, I should. Uh, <laughs> ah, now the mic is back. So I hear that there the the reasons are somehow threefold. The last one you said improving quality of teaching by uh, using this um, online new online methods and yeah. uh, learning about these online methods. Second is um, internationalization, making known the own university all over the world. And third is for attracting new students. Yeah. More? Uh, any other reasons, for please? For keeping our profile. For keeping profile, you know, yeah. yeah. For disseminating knowledge. Mm -hmm. We are publicly funded, so we need something mm -hmm. to do back to uh, as well. Mm -hmm. For improving our uh, ways of teaching, because yeah. that's the other way. Okay. So okay. Mauro? Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely. You made it so clear. Nothing to add to this. Uh, okay, okay. Half done. <laughs> Uh, your your yeah. institution, the reasons for doing MOOCs uh, in your institution, <laughs> because uh, you are pressing, or are there also other? Well, well uh, we are, we are uh, doing a lot of pushing actually. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. we're trying to motivate people to mm -hmm. uh, become interested in in, mm -hmm. in, in MOOC, and it's a really not uh, it's not an easy mm -hmm. task. Uh, I would say that we. 
um, have like 20% of the faculties are interested in the mm -hmm. digital. Mm -hmm. And 80% mm -hmm. uh, are still in, 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 in the print age, mm -hmm. I would say. And we have, yeah, this is Norway, okay. yeah. uh, believe it yeah. or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we have, uh, the surveys have been okay. done that 90% uh -huh. of the faculties or the professors mm -hmm. prefer to stand and talk in front of the students. Okay. Yeah, 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 but that's uh, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. No, yeah. Doubt. Okay. no doubt, okay. Yeah. But I'm saying yeah. that, um, uh, mm -hmm. The way that we uh -huh. have to do it is, first of all, we have to mm -hmm. create tangible results. Mm -hmm. So the results which mm -hmm. are important for the top management is one, mm -hmm. that we publish, mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. we extract results, sure. uh, and we do all these academic uh, sure. things, and that we have students who go through, so, mm -hmm. um, and okay. that we have yeah. something tangible. That creates uh, creates uh, um, um, uh, motivation for, but then it it, it follows the uh, the top down idea that when the rector, which is very po uh, the top management is very often positive to digital, mm -hmm. but they have their proceedings yeah, and that it has to go down to uh, okay. the deans and. But this to means the you don't have any strategy from the top. There is a strategy, but it has to be talked. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, uh, I just see uh, that we still have uh, just 10 minutes left. So I think there might be questions from the audience here, yeah, please. Uh, now the f first we start here. Uh, okay, the, you have the mic. So, okay, you start and then uh, here in the front. So my question is, um, how does faculty staff react to all this? By that I mean uh, you have students taking MOOCs instead of <coughs> going into class. Mm -hmm. uh, does does a professor say you are stealing a good part of my job or does he say thank you for allowing me to do some more research <laughs> <laughs> in my university both answers are there yeah. even a third one as well you know when you start with the 50 first MOOCs I mean mm -hmm. or, you know courses yeah. it's easy they are all very enthusiastic then when you start getting more numbers it becomes a little mm -hmm. more difficult mm -hmm. but that's exactly yeah, it's yeah. very much of a mixed audience mm -hmm. what is important is mm -hmm. to develop a good MOOC and to have students mm -hmm. and move into the flipped classroom mm -hmm. it is not a process which happens mm -hmm. in a week yeah. but yeah. it's there if mm -hmm. you push towards yeah. it mm -hmm. other remarks well, that? everything is said yeah okay mm -hmm. then you have to mic okay up. so I have a question and then I have a, a story it mm -hmm. will be very short, okay. so and I like <laughs> to yeah. comment. So the first question is: I, I understand that you tell your students go out there, find a MOOC that you like and is uh, interesting for your course, okay? And then you may have uh, that situation where you don't have the faculty to to validate and understand that. But how much uh, ECTS, you know, in mm. in Europe you use this, right? Uh, how can you evaluate if that MOOC value how much do you score it on ECTS the, the courses that's that's my question but then uh, yeah. um, it's up to academic council and academic supervisor of each educational program to decide whether it's one credit or two or three or uh, because even even if we have our own MOOC it's again the story of uh, the program and the exactly implementation to the very program because, for example, if we have a MOOC in economics by our renowned Professor Berzon, he's very well known in Russia, and if um, a student from philosophy or sociology or some other department will take this course in financial economic, and then we'll come to uh, his or her department and say, okay, I, I, I have su I've succeeded, I, I have this uh, MOOC. They will give him, I don't know, two or three credits maybe. But if the, uh, the same MOOCs, uh, MOOC will be taken by a student uh, from the f um, Department of Economics, and he will come and say, I have this MOOC. They say, okay, but twice as much we have offline. Come and listen to Professor okay, Berzon. Okay, no credit for you. They will. Okay, it's, it's academic it community, academic councils, supervisors to, to, to make a decision. Okay. Uh, but 
now they are start to asking us, okay, make a firm regulations. And we, and we are still not sure that we have to do that because MOOCs are so uh, rapidly changing uh, thing that we we spent three months or half a year uh, producing that regulations and then okay it's then there are new MOOCs yeah new, new MOOCs on so. new conditions on new technologies or whatever and okay we don't need it <laughs> maybe okay, okay so yeah, there is something to it still what puzzles puzzles me it's the quality and the exam I mean the Bologna process if you look at it it's all about learning goals mm -hmm. and assessing them and really have been sure that you have reached these mm -hmm. particular yeah. learning goals. So if you create a course, the, the, the one who does it, he should know what learning goals mm -hmm. are meant to be reached. What they are worth in a program from economists versus uh, students for thing, that's from the examining board. But I would like to be to have these things really tied together because otherwise we get slippery because then everybody mm -hmm. can produce MOOCs and everybody can take exams and so I, I mean that's the core if we do micro masters mini masters nano or whatsoever as soon as we get credits and tied it to a MSc or BSc we have to be very careful about that mm -hmm. so that's my plea for okay th let, yeah. let okay. me finish so I work in Portugal and uh, we are trying to try to solve all the issues that you said about sustainability and so on. And so we are trying to create a nationwide solution for all universities. And we are going to attempt also for public administration and even uh, um, companies that are not for profit. Okay, So joining everyone on the same boat mm -hmm. and try to, to use that as a, a, a way to reduce costs and increase sustainability. Our strategy will be for the first two years to try to pay universities to create courses so that they uh, uh, get the tangible results. And then hopefully this will be just too big to fail. And then the state will just have to offer us money. Otherwise, they will not be voted uh, mm -hmm. on the next <laughs> elections. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> well... So that's a strategy. This is a uh, risky strategy, I would say, at least uh, if in my country. you have any <laughs> ideas about this, <laughs> please feel to share. Answer to this? No. 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 Okay. Another? Yeah. Whoa, best yeah. wishes. Best, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are other questions? Yeah, yeah I'm from... Uh, Norway as well, I'm working mm -hmm. with Hofdam. And one of the problems I met was that we got some, uh, some money in the project after all, <laughs> peanuts, but uh, okay, and it's some kind of money. And then sometimes we invite professors in to create MOOCs. And we would like to reward them for the, the extra effort because the problem is they're working full time mm -hmm. and uh, we can't, we're not allowed to pay them all the time. So there's, there's, it's nearly impossible to move money from the project we've got to the institution and to the professor. So do you pay people to do this or is this uh, voluntary work? That's my uh, first question. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, another thing is, I think really think we have to solve this problem with assessment. I and fear we can only ask one uh, question. We have two minutes yeah. left. Okay, but then <laughs> ju yeah. Just, yeah. just First quickly. question. So and then th th there, yeah. there is yeah. this thing about yeah. trust. I mm, think yeah. like oh. for the basic oh. courses, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's okay to, uh, to, to work on the old-fashioned system where you, you're sure that the person passes an exam. But when it comes to further education, it's more about like the, the responsibility lies on the person who takes the courses mm. to present himself to the uh, employer. And that's a completely different way of looking at um, examinations and um, qualifications. There's still some quality about mm -hmm. the university yeah. degree, no? I would, I would just like to conclude back. everything yeah. that everybody of you can still either answer this or say a few recommendations uh, for MOOCs. I can answer you a question about funding. We give funding to the faculty and we have a production team and the faculty, uh, they get some money, but it's never enough. So, but it's enough to, to, to do something and for a start and for the rest, we hope that they will have some hours left and mm -hmm. hire assistance or whatsoever. Yeah. Mauro? 
Yeah, we, we do pay uh, with a pay. I mean, it's not a lot of money, and it's about, I would say, something like 10 to 15 percent of the overall cost of a MOOC. And it is important that we have some scalability cost. You know, the, the average cost for a MOOC on the market is between 120 and 150 if you sort of like look around and and we, we, we you know in the south we can produce for less but still it is a costly <laughs> it's a costly undertaking and we do pay teachers i mean it's an incentive and we pay for hospitality mm -hmm. and coming to naples to do a MOOC usually mm -hmm. it's nicer mm -hmm. than okay. going i don't know i mean to a rainy okay. place so. okay. <laughs> xenia um, yes we also have to pay uh, to our professors and um, but uh, it's not a very big amount but still uh, but after the course has been pr produced um, we still have to pay a very small amount to the assistant who will uh, supervise whether everything is okay and answer on forums and stuff like that so uh, university continues to pay uh, during the whole period, uh, the MOOC exists. Mm -hmm. Well, y you answer your colleague, but uh, you might have another final <laughs> remark. F final <laughs> remark. Uh, well, I think that uh, th the most important thing is that we get motivated professors mm -hmm. and we support them. Mm. Uh, so this autumn, uh, we have managed to recruit a staff of uh, various competences and uh, we have to support them one way or the other either it's yeah. through supervising or we uh, assign them resources that's okay okay so uh, i think we have answered a few questions more many more questions are open but we have now coffee time we can continue the discussion i thank all the speakers for this lively session thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you.